Okay, everyone. Uh, let's just get into it. So the objectives for this talk are to review terminology and ethics of kidney donation, because I've always found them extremely confusing. And uh, just by doing this, maybe I'm getting a little bit of a grip on it. And hopefully I can share that with you. Uh, I want to review kidney donation statistics, just sort of around the world, and just see what's going on. Uh, outline strategies to increase the donor pool, just a brief overview there. I want to review some of the surgical options and then describe long-term outcomes, which will be the, the focus. So let's go into the terminology and ethics. So it's pretty basic. There's a deceased donor and there's a living donor. Pretty self-explanatory. There's also all these terms that uh, get thrown around for deceased donors, and they're, uh, it's hard to know what they mean and what the prognosis is for each of them if you haven't really uh, looked it up. So there's standard criteria donors, which I'll talk about, donation after cardiac death, extended criteria donors, and then there's this category called donation after brain death. And the donation after brain death basically encompasses the uh, standard criteria donors and the ECD donors here. It can be either or, depending on some criteria that they fulfill. So basically, to get a diagnosis of brain death, you have to have irreversible loss of brain function, uh, two physicians usually have to conclude that you are in fact uh, brain dead and again you can go into either category. <coughs> so the deceased donor, the prototypical uh, uh, standard donor is that 35 year old male who gets in a motor vehicle accident, totally healthy and uh, the brain's injured and everything else is preserved. That's the, the standard criteria donor right there. Uh, the less than 60 is sort of gray because some, some places will say it's less than 50 years old, but I think the key uh, definition of this is it doesn't meet criteria for extended criteria donor, which I'll talk about in a second. So the donation after cardiac death, basically this is when there's cessation of cardiac function prior to the organ being harvested, and it may or may not meet criteria for brain death, but that's going to happen very soon once the heart stops beating. And certainly once the heart stops beating, that's going to be warm ischemic time for all the organs that are within the body. Uh, there's two sort of ways to think about it. There's a controlled DCD situation where that's when the patient's on life support. They take them off to make sure that heart's not beating. And then they can get them right to the operating room right away. All the consent's done. Everything's ready to go. And it's all in a controlled setting. The uncontrolled setting is that picture on the right where they're in the emergency room. Cardiac arrest right away. Or they're on the operating table. Cardiac arrest and it's just not controlled. There's more warm ischemic time associated with it, and the prognosis for that's quite a bit worse. So if we look at the extended criteria donor, this is, you have to be greater than 60 years old and fairly healthy, or 50 to 59 and have two of those three variables. So if we put that into the framework here, basically, brain death has occurred or is coming soon, you can go into two categories. Your heart can st stop beating, or you can be brain dead as assessed by a physician. Then you can be a controlled DCD or an uncontrolled DCD, and that takes you down to the third rung, which you can be a standard criteria donor, an extended criteria donor, or the third category is the DCD category. So what are the outcomes? Because I think that's what really matters. Uh, all these terms are getting thrown around, but doesn't mean anything. And, and it does mean something. Uh, surprisingly enough. Basically, standard criteria donor seems to be a little better than a uh, controlled DCD donor, although some places will say they have similar long-term outcomes. Uh, certainly, DCD does have increased acute rejection episodes compared to the standard criteria donor. And if we look at uh, just a graph on how graph survival is over a five-year span, we can see that uh, the top line, that represents our standard criteria donor. The very, very bottom line, that's the ECD, DCD category. So that's a bad prognosis, lots of warm ischemic time, bad long-term survival of that graft. And we can see just right below this average red line is where the uh, DCD sits. So it's pretty good long-term prognosis for that particular category. So living donors. Again, it's pretty simple to start out. It's related or unrelated. Pretty simple. Related means you have a blood relationship to that person. Unrelated means 
Uh, they could be a spouse, a friend, or some anonymous donor that you don't know. Uh, why do we need living donors? This is a huge ethical question that's uh, part of the talk today. Uh, well, there's not enough deceased donors to meet the demand pretty much anywhere. Uh, there's better results with living donors because everything's controlled. We can match people appropriately to their HLA type and we can get that organ out and into another body in a timely fashion. We can do the preemptive transplant, which also has been shown to uh, improve graft survival long term and imp improve recipient quality of life. So, is there a difference between living unrelated versus living related kidney transplantation? This is an Iranian study, and Iran's really interesting in the uh, world of donors because Iran uh, has a system where you can pay for a kidney. So you'll notice they have a lot of living unrelated donors there and that's uh, probably a reflection of their system where you can pay for this and that, that's a very controversial thing in and of itself whether or not you should do this. But anyways, the study was the largest I could find uh, comparing the two groups. And basically what you see is the one and 15 year survival of the graft itself is quite comparable, as is the patient survival overall. And there was no significant difference found in this, in this study. So basically they said results are comparable. And ultimately, probably the better results are going to come with a healthier donor and better matching of the tissue. Pretty they're not always matched as well as they could. Sometimes a living donor, like a living related donor, will say, I'm not donating to somebody else. I'm only donating to my brother. I'm only donating to my sister. And in that case, they may not be matched as well. So it's, uh, there's patient preference that plays into it too. So what about the older living donor? We're doing more operations on older people right now. If we look at patient survival for older living donors, we can see that right around the age of 65 and above, we start getting worse outcomes closer to the ECD category. Younger than 65, if you're a healthy donor, things seem to be pretty good. And this graph just emphasizes the exact same thing. The ECDs, this is bottom line right here. Essentially, these ones have the worst prognosis as of now. The top line is the young category. These patients age less than 60. And everything else falls between as it should. <laughs> So, changing gears here, ethical principles are a cornerstone of kidney donation. And uh, they're pretty uh, dry to go through, but at the same time, it's really good to have a sense of them. And this is a, a good thing for medicine in general. So, as far as kidney donors go, we want to we do good. We want to do good for the recipient, but also for the donor. Uh, no one will say taking out a kidney from somebody is doing good for them. So, we're not sort of fully playing there, but there might be some psychosocial benefits that they get out of doing uh, the donation, so maybe that is some good. Uh, we don't want to do any harm, and I think this comes into the donor screening. You have to really carefully assess these donors to make sure that they're going to go through this well and have good long-term outcomes, because if they have poor outcomes, then you are really doing harm to a healthy person who otherwise wouldn't have been touched by the medical system. Autonomy is a key principle in uh, donation, especially with the living donation. Uh, ultimately, we need to respect the individual, the recipient can refuse an organ if they want. If they're on the ECD list and they don't want that organ, they can refuse it. If there's free exchange among individuals, if I want to donate to my sister, I should be able to. You can direct that donation, like I said, to my sister, and it should be transparent what's going on with all the allocation. This idea of justice and equality sort of uh, contradicts patient autonomy somewhat because sometimes we might want to, as a society, have an organ go to a waitlist patient rather than somebody that that patient would want them to go to. And uh, justice means equal for all, as much as we can be. And then utility is just maximizing good. And the, the good that we're really doing is for this one population of people with end-stage renal disease. Uh, the donors are just sort of a tool in that process. So looking at some specific things related to kidney donation, um, deceased donors, as it stands right now, deceased donation is anonymous. The, uh, the family who's uh, agreed to that donation of their loved one, they won't know who's getting that kidney and vice versa. 
and that's how it goes. There's been some case reports of people uh, not wanting organs given based on religious values, based on racial values, and uh, society's just deemed that's not appropriate, and it's a, a central organization that's responsible for getting these kidneys where they need to go. Living donation is a bit of a different beast. You can have directed donation. Say, I, I'm giving this to this person. It can be a stranger who directs donation, and this could be, you could be in church and you put up flyers and you say, I need a kidney. And somebody in that church says, I'm going to give you that kidney. And that's sort of what that category goes. Or you can be a non-directed donation. So this is the, uh, the altruistic donor who says, I just want to give a kidney to be a good citizen. And then one of the other tenets that uh, we come, come through is commercially motivated donations is unacceptable in our society because it really takes advantage of vulnerable populations. So second objective, we need to review kidney donation statistics. Uh, so this rate per million population is a common thing used in uh, kidney statistics and donation. The goal rate, according to the European Association guidelines, is greater than 40 kidneys per million population. And it's their thought that the gap between su supply and demand will stabilize at this level. And below this level, the demand will increase compared to supply. I don't think it's a perfect level because some other numbers I'll show you later have higher, but the demand's still going up. So here's Canada. In Canada in 2012, this is the most recent data I could find graphically, but basically you can see that the donor rate from 2006 to 2012 is pretty stable. Just a little over a thousand kidneys both, both years and about half living, half deceased. If we look at this metric here, I wanted to focus on this area here. This is our rate per million population. So about living it was 15 in 2012 and deceased it was 15 in 2012 for a total of 30. So we're well under that 40 mark that was set by the EAU. And if we look at the wait list in Canada over time, in 2003, 2,800 basically, and up to 2012, it was 3,400. So we're gradually climbing up in our waiting list. And while people are waiting, unfortunately, there's some people dying, not getting the kidneys. So that's, that's the sad reality. In BC, we're doing okay, and this year we're doing really well. In 2014, deceased donors there was 101, living donors there was 104. And if you put that out into the rate per million population, it's a little over 40 based on what we're doing. So we're actually, we're actually seeing gains, and I think it's uh, in part due to all the advertising and the good infrastructure that's in place right now. Who, so the who, who, which provinces are lagging and causing the it was BC. BC in 2012 was uh, one of the culprits. The West in general was uh, was poor, but I think uh, I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening right now to, to address that. But uh, I was surprised that BC was poor because we're so biased because that's all we see is kidney transplants when we're doing things. But uh, uh, we weren't as good as as I expected. Ontario is quite good, and Quebec sort of takes it down a bit too. Uh, so the current stats. First three months of the year, there's been 31 living donors done and 41 deceased donors. So we're on pace for 124 living donors and 164 deceased donors right now. I don't think we'll keep up that pace, but uh, that would blow our uh, rate per million population out of the water if we keep up on that pace. Uh, the number of patients on the wait list right now are 361. It doesn't seem like that much, but uh, it's hard for that number to go down. People are always getting added. People are getting taken off. And our average wait time for a kidney is 4.8 years, and even in BC, people are still dying waiting for kidneys. So in the USA, what's going on there? USA has a great <laughs> per million population rate. Uh, they just have great infrastructures within the country where they're really able to, uh, um, they have an organ procurement uh, network where they can really uh, divvy organs out. They have good education in the public where people are uh, doing live kidney mm -hmm. donation. But their wait list is, bam, drastically climbing, even though they're doing 16,000 kidney transplants per year. So they have this high per million population category, but their rate of uh, disease and need is drastically climbing. So in Europe, I just wanted to highlight one aspect of Europe, and that's Spain. 
Spain, deceased donor rate alone is 45.2. Portugal, just above it, is 49.1. Most other countries are less than 30, and it's because in those countries they have specific legislation that I'll talk about in a second that uh, allows them to access more deceased donors. Okay, next we'll go into outline strategies to increase the donor pool, and it's just a brief overview of this. So this is sort of what... Uh, what's happening now, it's pretty current stuff. Um, basically, the Kidney BC network has gone out and they've done this uh, grassroots project where they're attempting to poll communities and people to see what they think about end-stage renal disease, what we need to do to get more people to sign up to become a donor, and questions around that. Basically, they went to these 12 communities, and they had some recommendations. One thing they found was that 95% of British Columbians said that they were in favor of donation, yet only 20% have re been uh, registered right now. Works out to about 900,000 900, people are basically registered as organ donors. Well, this is all going to culminate on May 1st, so just a few weeks away at the Vancouver Con Convention Center they're going to address two controversial questions right now uh, as part of a continuation from that project. They're going to say, should BC adopt legislation that assures everyone is an or organ donor unless they register to opt out? So this is the presumed consent legislation that uh, is happening in Spain, is happening in Portugal, and is happening elsewhere in the world where they have very high rates of deceased donor um, donation. Next question they want to ask is, should BC provide incentives to people who register as an organ donor or who, to, who agree to becoming a living organ donor? So those are two things they're going to address. They're going to have a jury who deliberates. They're going to have media there. They're going to have people from government. And they're going to come, try and come up with some policies. Nova Scotia is also right now in the process of thinking if they want to do this presumed consent. So what are some strategies we can do to increase the deceased donor supply. Well, Australia is a neat uh, case study in and of itself. In around 2000, Australia's rate per million population was 10 for deceased donors, so very low. And they were apparently very disorganized, and the only people that were really pushing the organ donation themselves were the kidney surgeons and the nephrologists who were actively participating in it. There wasn't that good structure like we have here with Transplant BC. So they came up with nine measures, and this was, just like we're doing now, it was a grassroots project where they went in and they talked to people, and it was also a governmental project where a bunch of funds got put in uh, to create different organizations. So they came up with these nine tenants, and, uh, and they're really important uh, because I think these are probably the cornerstones of any good national transplant program. So. You need a national authority, a network of organ and tissue donation agencies. The USA has a great one of these, and Australia now, now is coming up with this as well. You need specialist hospitals and staff and systems dedicated to organ donation. So these are really the ICU teams, the ICU doctors, and everyone involved in critical care. You need new funding for the hospitals, and they found that. You need a national professional education and awareness, and they've got campaigns going right now much like the campaigns we're running right now to try and increase uh, enrollment. You need coordinated, ongoing community awareness. We said that. You need support for donor families. Uh, sometimes this is lacking. This is one area that uh, donors sometimes feel like they're left out uh, to dry once the kidney goes, and uh, there's lots of stuff over the internet about, about uh, not feeling well supported as they're recovering. It needs to be safe, equitable, and transparent. So that's one of the ethical principles. And that's about it. So presumed consent. So Spain, they passed this legislation in 1979. In 2014, they had that 45.2 PMP. From 1979 to 1989, they actually didn't have a very good donation rate, even though they had the presumed consent. They didn't start getting that until they created this strong infrastructure, and they have these people called transplant donor coordinators who are all physicians, and they really coordinate all the care. 
they're mostly ICU staff, but they're also involved in uh, transplant nephrology. And then they have this great infrastructure in Spain that's made everything possible, and everyone knows what to do. When somebody's uh, presumed to be a good organ donor, bam, they start putting the lines in that patient, they start contacting the family. It's not uh, done in isolation. If the family does still want to withdraw, that's totally within their right, unless the patient's uh, expressed saying, hey, I need to be an organ donor. This is what I want in my life. But, uh, so it's not totally presumed consent, but uh, the presumed consent does let them get some stuff going before they might be talking to family. So it's, a, it's an important, uh, important thing. So strategies to increase the living donor supply. So basically this starts in the referral process. Nephrologists are the real people who are uh, dealing with these end-stage renal disease patients all the time. Uh, they need to talk to them early, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure some nephrologists are probably great at this, and others are probably uh, not that good at opening the dialogue. Um, basically, why this is so important is if there is a donor that's suitable, this pre-dialysis transplantation can really, really improve the quality and longevity of that patient's life. Also, increased transplant rates um, have been shown to occur when nephrologists are involved early with the process. As far as resources goes, we need to discuss the donor process with the donor and the family themselves. Arrange reimbursement if able, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and we need to provide good support to the donor. Okay, and we need to encourage healthy living unrelated donors. So social media is an interesting thing. This is, uh, this is a hot topic right now. There's this website called matchingdonors.com, and Basically, what they say on their website is many patients get their transplant through matchingdonor.com within six months of signing up on this website. So basically, it's a, it's a networking thing. If you want to be a donor, bam, you click the button, put in your demographics, and they can hook you up with somebody all the way across the country. So it's a, it's a neat way to connect uh, if that message is out and if you're interested in doing something like that. Facebook, there was a study by, in Facebook by Chang et al., who uh, looked at 91 potential recipients who had posted on Facebook. 32% uh, had people that were actually being worked up to be a potential donor for them, and 10% got a live kidney out of this whole process. So it's pretty good. It's online dating. Yeah, it's online dating. <laughs> Except you score. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> Who owns that matching? <laughs> who owns what? Sorry. Who owns the you know, I don't. I'm not sure who owns it. It's a good question. I I, I feel like it was. Okay, so medical and surgical aspects uh, to, to that we can improve on. Uh, minimally invasive uh, harvesting of the organs. Uh, patients who are healthy, they don't want massive scars everywhere. They want something little that uh, can be hidden if possible and certainly something they can recover from fast. Um, the paired kidney exchange is going on uh, here in Canada already and uh, I think it's well known. We've talked about it many times before. Uh, transplant grafts with anatomic pathologic abnormalities. You know, these are stuff we could consider uh, getting, reconstructing, and putting into recipients. Uh, Samir gave a great talk on restored kidneys uh, about a year ago, so I didn't want to go into it again. But, uh, but basically, it's possible. Little tumors in kidneys, you can just pluck them out, and St. Paul's had a recent case that they, that they did that very thing, and put it into the uh, person with end-stage renal disease, and really and truly, that uh, creates a whole new life for that person. Uh, complex vasculature, multiple arteries and stuff. Maybe with, uh, you know, not to be cocky and stuff, maybe with how good we're getting, maybe we can start uh, taking on some more of those challenges. Uh, ABO incompatibility. So this, is, this comes down to that uh, related donor who says, no, I'm not donating to anybody but my brother. Maybe they're not the same ABO. You could potentially use that person uh, with plasmapheresis, uh, uh, intensified uh, immunosuppression with like rituximab and other immunosuppressive drugs. And you could potentially have good outcomes. This is three years outcomes here in this uh, this study, and basically they looked at uh, 
people who were ABO incompatible who got the plasmapheresis, or they got a dual chamber plasmapheresis with an absorption process or something like that. Uh, but the bottom line is at three years, their graft survival is quite good. So post donation. This is probably something we don't do all that well. Uh, medical leave off work. There is an Organ Donor Leave Act in Ontario and the US. I'm not sure that it's in BC right now. But uh, basically in the US, you get 30 days off work. It's not paid as of right now unless your employer wants to pay you. Ontario, you can have up to 13 weeks unpaid time off. Uh, ultimately, we should be reimbursing uh, these donors all their costs because sometimes it is quite a costly uh, expense for them. And there is a living organ donation expense reimbursement program here in British Columbia where they attempt to do that. They attempt to get meals, lodging, they attempt to make it a uh, net zero gain uh, effort for that donor because ultimately it's a gift they're giving and uh, we still don't feel like they should be getting paid for that. Although there's some talk about maybe we should. And then should we give them a medal of honor, give it a ceremony once a year, bring them up to Parliament Hill and say, good job. So I just want to touch on black market kidneys because I find it a, an interesting topic. Uh, these are all these guys lined up with these huge flank incisions right there. And uh, likely they were uh, given some money, probably quite low amounts of money, for their kidney to be harvested. And uh, I found it really interesting that... Uh, there's actually like websites where you can go on, find out how much kidneys are, and you can, uh, you know, pick w pick which place you want to go get your kidney from. So there's a nice uh, study here. This was by Jay Gill, who's a nephrologist, a transplant nephrologist at St. Paul's, and uh, this was when he was at UCLA, I, I guess. Uh, but basically, it was looking at uh, 33 kidney transplant recipients who traveled abroad for transplant. Now, I think some of them probably had legitimate uh, donors lined up, but certainly some of them probably did not. And I found, uh, I found this particular donor quite, uh, quite telling of what, what bad can happen when you go abroad to uh, get a kidney. Basically, uh, he came home, ended up in the ICU, uh, horrible, horrible, horrible hospital course, ending with the kidney coming out. And really and truly, he almost died throughout the whole process. So uh, that, was, that was a bad one. So I just want to briefly review the surgical options for living kidney donation. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on them, but just to, to let you know that we're starting to get into a trend where we're going more minimally invasive. Uh, that's the idea. So the open donor nephrectomy, that's, that was the gold standard for many, many years. We can see that uh, the flank incision retroperitoneal approach slowly trending down over time. The laparoscopic, not assisted, is, I was surprised it was only 30%. This is U.S. data, and a lot of people were doing laparoscopic hand assisted in U.S. data, which was uh, a bit surprising to me, just biased because we do so much, just pure lap here. So the pros they found of an open donor nephrectomy, decreased warm ischemic time, you're open there, you take that kidney out, bam, it's out. Uh, and a shorter operation. The cons, uh, pain, rehabilitation, cosmetics. Those are the cons, really, of an open donor nephrectomy. And it's sort of, uh, uh, I'm not sure anyone's doing open donor nephrectomy anymore at this stage. Laparoscopic donor nephrectomy, this is certainly what we're familiar with. A three port technique, occasionally a fourth port if we're really having troubles out lateral, and then a fan and steel incision to extract. So, so there's a nice study here that uh, was from UCLA, 1,325 cases from 2000 to 2013. And, and uh, I didn't get into too many details of this, but this study was really interesting in that uh, they looked at all their complications over a 13 year span. And whenever they had a complication, they went and they evaluated why they did things. So they, like in an M&M type round, and they changed something. <laughs> so it was, uh, if there was a complication, bam, we're changing something. And uh, it, it was neat how there was the progression. Overall, though, complication rate was very low. 7.9% of all comers, with 6.1% of these those being clavian in class 1. Basically, they thought uh, the duration of the procedure the blood loss, the surgeon, the year that the procedure was done, whichever side you were doing, the gender of the patient weren't predictive of a complication. Basically saying complications just happen sometimes. It's part of, part of uh, doing business. 
uh, but overall there was a very low complication rate and there was very good satisfaction with the procedure. So I was surprised that there were so many hand assisted donor nephrectomies going on, but it makes sense why, why there would be a hand assist. Uh, you already have your extraction port uh, ready there and bam, once the kidney comes out, just pull it out. So hypothetically, you might decrease warm ischemic time. Uh, so this was a nice little study over a 10 year period, uh, hand assisted versus pure laparoscopic. Uh, essentially what they found, in interoperative parameters, uh, there was no significant difference between operative time, warm ischemic time, blood transfusion or estimated blood loss. And as far as complications, they found a very, very low rate of complications in both groups. And essentially, although they did have a couple Clavian class three complications, one in each group, which is a, you know, we should try and avoid those if we can. Uh, but basically they thought they were equal and equivalent and they thought maybe we should be doing more pure laparoscopic donor nephrectomy after this because of the low complication rate and the good graft survival. So less donor nephrectomy, this is a hot topic right now. Uh, single port, all your instruments are there together, clashing. You can have these uh, instruments over here that have the, uh, the curvature to help triangulate. But uh, certainly uh, there's technical challenges to this one and I'm sure there's a, a steep learning curve to be very good at a, at a less donor nephrectomy. Uh, so there's a nice review and this was done by uh, one of our own, Homie, uh, from Cleveland Clinic. So this was uh, basically looking at less versus laparoscopic living donor nephrectomy. And basically the incisions were mostly umbilical and a couple fan and steel incisions. And Essentially, a couple of them required a few extra ports uh, to help with retraction. So uh, you wonder if that would be considered a conversion because you're getting two, uh, two holes instead of the three that we do now. So what they found is a regular laparoscopic donor nephrectomy showed decreased operative time. The less laparoscopic donor nephrectomy had decreased estimated blood loss. Surprisingly, I was surprised with that and increased conversion rates. And what they're talking about conversion is conversion away from the procedure they intended. So it was just going to like a standard laparoscopic procedure. Uh, but basically there was no difference in uh, key parameters that we're looking at in kidney function survival. So there's one case study of an, a robotic less donor nephrectomy. And uh, I'm sure there'll be more of this coming down the road. Uh, but the reason to do this is because we can and uh, potentially better cosmetics. Uh, but there's no real difference in outcomes. Uh, this is one thing I'm particularly interested in is a notes donor nephrectomy. Notes is natural orifice, uh, trans, oh, I forget what it is, endoscopic surgery. But basically you're going through natural orifices and not creating incisions in the actual skin. So I like this one. So this is a, a woman. She's got the typical three port laparoscopic donor nephrectomy going, and then she's got a, a fourth port going into the vagina uh, where they're actually putting this extraction bag, and this is the exact same technique that Dr. Guan uses where he'll hoist up the kidney, put the uh, artery and vein on tension to be able to staple across. So the feasibility of this transvaginal natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery, there it is. Uh, basically they had 20 people in the notes category and they, they uh, looked at people, parameters, they looked at like how stretchy was your vagina, have you had a previous uh, pregnancy, because I mean, you, you had to look at those things preoperatively to see if it was even feasible to do. Um, most of these women had uteruses still, so it was, uh, it was pretty good. Anyway, uh, looking at their outcomes, the only significant difference was the warm ischemic time was a little bit worse for the transvaginal. And uh, the authors were wondering if that just has to do with not being as comfortable with the technique and extraction and maybe that would improve over time. But that's certainly an important parameter when we're thinking about uh, surgery for, uh, for donor nephrectomy. But what they did find, the sexual function was unaffected and there was good graft function in the recipient for those ones. So ultimately, it's the same old story with different surgical techniques I find. It, it doesn't really seem, it doesn't matter what way you do it, as long as you're good at doing it, you're probably going to have good outcomes, is the bottom line with this. Uh, these donors who are healthy, they do want cosmetics. That is an important thing for this particular patient group uh, compared to some. Uh, so that's something to think about. And there is this trend towards uh, less procedures and 
as minimally invasive as it can be. So last thing I just want to talk about uh, briefly is uh, the long-term uh, living donor outcomes. And there's been a few recent studies on this to uh, suggest we maybe we should rethink or maybe we shouldn't. I'll let you decide. So the first kidney donor in North America, I think this is interesting, was Ronald Herrick, his brother Richard Herrick. Both of them are twins, 23 years old. They were a really good match. So he donated to his twin brother in 1954. He actually developed end-stage renal disease. And he was on dialysis a little less than a decade. He died at 79 years old because of cardiovascular disease when he was getting heart surgery. So, I mean, just based on this first guy, you've got to ask yourself the question, uh, did donating the kidney affect his health? And do donors have increased risk of end-stage renal disease and cardiovascular disease compared to match cohorts? But that's an important question, and people want to know that when they're signing up for this procedure. So one study that's often cited in the uh, donor nephrectomy literature is this one that was from 1993, and it's a pretty cool study. 45 years of follow-up after uni nephrectomy. So basically, they had a population of 62 <coughs> people, men, with a mean age of 25 years old. And basically, these were army personnel in World War II, and they lost a kidney due to trauma. So it's that healthy population, and it's pretty analogous to a, a healthy donor as well. Uh, so they looked at servicemen of the same age, as their comparison group. And what they found, in mora mortality, there was no difference long term. Hypertension, no difference. Kidney dysfunction, they did find a slight increased risk of kidney dysfunction at 18%, but when they did a, a subsequent analysis, they thought that this was probably related to other conditions and not actually the uh, uni nephrectomy status, or the uni kidney status. Uh, so this is uh, one of the best studies in the long-term consequences of kidney donation. This is a New England Journal of Medicine study that came out in 2009. Uh, the goal of the study was to compare kidney donors to the general population, and that's going to be an important distinction when we look at the next studies. Uh, so then what they wanted to look at was GFR, hypertension, general health status, and quality of life. Uh, this was done in the U.S. Uh, they started with about 3,700 donors. And they got responses from 2,200 of them, so pretty good response. And they were giving lab results and status updates periodically. And then there's this uh, survival curve right here showing that the donors compared to the control group, no difference in long-term survival when you go out to 40 years. So they did a subgroup analysis on people they had follow-up information for greater than 20 years. I won't go into too many of the nuances, but I just wanted to focus on the key outcomes. So blood pressure, they found a significant difference in systolic blood pressure, but likely not a clinically significant difference. As far as the clinical conditions, diabetes decreased in the uh, donor population compared to general population, but not significant. Cancer, similar across groups. Coronary heart disease, possibly decreased in the uh, donor population and cerebral vascular accident, again, possibly decreased in the donor population. So end-stage renal disease, 11 donors needed dialysis or a transplant out of that initial group. I'm backwards. Sorry. Anyways, the incidence of that was 180 per million population per year in the donor group. The control group was quite a little bit higher than that. So they felt like end-stage renal disease wasn't really affected by uh, giving up a kidney. Their conclusion, survival, hypertension, end-stage renal disease were similar to the general population and they felt that most donors had a preserved GFR and excellent quality of life. Uh, almost get in there. So mortality and cardiovascular disease among mm -hmm. older live kidney donors. I think this old population is really interesting because there is a trend for us to operate on older people nowadays, so we should really know what they're getting into. This particular study came out in 2014, and basically they, again, matched to the general population and looked at patients who were operated on from 1996 to 2006. In that time, there were 3,400 live donors, basically, greater than 55 years old that they identified and their mean follow-up was 7.8 years. What they found was, as far as mortality goes, no real significant difference between those two groups as they went out to 10 years follow-up. Again, secondary outcome was mortality or cardiovascular events, so it was a combined outcome. And what they found at 10 years follow-up, there was no difference. So they didn't feel like this made any difference in terms of mor mortality. 
or cardiovascular events. So this is a, this is a good study because now we're getting into something that contradicts the other studies. So this is the first one that came out. Uh, this was a Norwegian study in 2014. And it looks like at the long-term risks of kidney donors. So their goal, and this is where this study is different, and, and I think it's, this study has a good point. They want to compare donors to healthy controls who would have been eligible to be donors themselves, not the general population. So the outcomes they wanted to look for were death, cardiovascular death, and renal function. The median follow-up in this group was 15.1 years. And as you see on this, the all-cause mortality was slightly increased for kidney donors. And if we look at hazard ratios, all-cause mortality was 1.3 compared to the control. Cardiovascular death was 1.4, and end-stage renal disease was a whopping 11. That's right. On this particular study, yep. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So their conclusion, and that's, that's one of the problems with the studies that you point out, is a lot of them don't have long-term data. So that's why uh, you keep falling back on that 45-year follow-up of the unique nephrectomy patients, because uh, that's one of the best studies we have in the big scheme of things. So it's a good point. It's a, it's a, it's a problem with the literature right now. Um, but th their conclusion in this study was increased risk of death, cardiovascular death, and end-stage renal disease compared to healthy controls, but still the risk was low. So final study I want to talk about is this one. And this one uh, got a heated debate going online. Dr. John Gill, who's a transplant nephrologist at St. Paul's, has wrote a couple editorials based on this study alone. And uh, uh, it's, it's quite a good study. I mean, it's, it's a really big study. It's got tons of donors. Um, the complaint of this particular study is that the control group was a 9,000 group control group and they did something called bootstrapping, which I'm not familiar with, but basically they, they multiplied the donors to be able to create two uh, homogenous groups. And the incidence of end-stage renal disease was low within the uh, control group. So they're wondering if that has uh, influenced outcomes to, to not be so accurate in this particular study. Uh, but nevertheless, the study's pretty good. Uh, it compares donors to healthy controls to the general population. And it's, it's key, is key looking for end-stage renal disease. Basically what they found is compared to healthy non-donors who would have been eligible to donate, live donors have a slightly increased risk of end-stage renal disease. Compared to the unscreened <coughs> population, they're probably better off in this particular study. Overall, though, the incidence is still very, very low. So what do we tell patients? Ultimately, uh, here's a summary of uh, a lot of the studies that are out there right now with all their outcomes. Uh, nice slide sort of wrapping everything up. But basically, the key is, what do we tell patients in the whole scheme of things? And ultimately, I think kidney donation is safe. It's got uh, very low complication rates. People recover very fast from it. People have very good qualities of life. People are generally happy with the cosmetic results. If we have to be specific, we probably would have to tell people there's probably a small increased risk of kidney disease compared to somebody who would be in the exact same health status as you right now. But compared to the general population, you're probably going to be just fine. And the chance of you having end-stage renal disease sometime in life is exceedingly low, but not non-existent. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Brown.